Hey, Ruby, how are you? Doing well. How are you? Good. So today we have Ruby from Real Dog Box, and I wanted to bring her on to really answer all the questions I get. So I get a lot of questions about what to do, how to feed raw, how to supplement treats with raw, how to add the raw food into the kibble, how can I make my kibble better? There's nothing better for me to do other than to just bring on the professional, someone who has for at least the last five plus years successfully helped at least, I believe, how many members are part of Real Dog Box now? Uh, we've got close to 6,000 monthly subscribers. Okay. Put this in there for Instagram. And we're live on Instagram too. There's a lot of people on there. Oh. Okay. So, last you said 6,000? We do, yeah. And we've probably helped tens of thousands of dogs make a transition from kibble to fresh food over the last almost eight years. We're celebrating eight years. Wow. Okay. And you know, if you're in business with dogs for eight years, that's a sign because many people don't <laughs> make it past the first one. Okay. So what have you, what are some of the biggest uh, things you've seen in the last eight years with dogs when they make that change? Well, the, the biggest change is the healthier skin and coat. I mean, there's, we've come up with six of the most common vet visits that can be prevented with fresh food. And a lot of the, the issues that we're seeing are like, my dog has allergies, itchy skin all the time, like Frito feet, as we like to call it, you know, their paws kind of smell yeasty. Um, we see them, you know, having gastrointestinal problems, like really big poops, big stinky poops and lots of diarrhea. Um, joint issues and dental health. Those are like probably our top four, you know, a lot of dogs that are suffering from arthritis and they're young, you know, dogs are athletes. They're not supposed to break down as young and quickly as we're starting to see. Um, and then the dental stuff, you know, a lot of periodontal disease, we see dogs like um, having all of these like uh, built up plaque and tartar around the gum line and that leads into so many other issues because that bacteria goes into the bloodstream and you know all of those things are are reasons why people think about you know what i think i need to change what i'm feeding for whatever reason uh and as soon as they make that switch it's like they have a new dog overnight and i i had a, a similar sort of revelation when i started feeding raw nearly a decade ago and that's how i got here into this business okay so I have seen similar results with clients that I have helped make the switch, especially with training. So I've seen dogs that have had a lot of behavior issues. And I think it stems from a gut imbalance and just not feeling comfortable and it manifests into anxiety. And I'm not saying that you can't train a dog with kibble or whatever you want. I've trained a lot of dogs with it, but I see the healthier change that like the dogs want to train. The dogs feel like they have the energy to train. And I've seen that when they make the switch. And I, of course, I've seen the healthier coat and healthier teeth, especially. I see that so far. This last week, we did the canine workshop with Real Dog Box for my Dutch Shepherd. His name is Vega. And this week, I've seen a big change in his teeth alone because I had been feeding him half like uh, raw treats, but not raw, uh, not raw food. So he's been on kibble. Because um, we just got him when we're making the transition, trying to see where he's at. And his poop went from being gray, which is a sign that there's too much bone in his diet. He was on Victor High Pro Plus before, to now little to no stool, which is, I'm still waiting. It's like I'm waiting for him to poop a lot. <laughs> Every day I'm like, is he good? <laughs> it's like too good to be true that there's nothing coming out. So, that's what I've noticed in the change with this dog in particular. But I wanted to ask you, so what are some of the biggest health risks associated with feeding raw dog food? Well, if you ask me what the risks are, I would say little to none. What the perceived risks, which is what a lot of veterinarians learn in vet school and later pass on to their clients is uh, nutritional imbalances. You know, where, where they're afraid that with a raw diet, you might not be giving your dog all of the nutrients that they need. Uh, and then the other concern is bacterial contamination. You know, they're afraid that 
they're, they're not very afraid that dogs are going to contract salmonella because, you know, a pathogenic bacteria like salmonella is naturally recurring in our dog's gut. It exists there. It exists all around us. But the fear is that if that salmonella is passed on to someone in the household that's immunocompromised, that that might cause some health issues for the human down the line. But, you know, we have answers for both of those concerns. The bacterial one is the least of my worries, dogs have a short acidic digestive tract, and they're created to processed fresh food, including all of those bacterial pathogens. If you've ever seen a street dog eating out of a, a the trash can, right? They probably are eating day old, two day, three, four, five, maybe week old food, and they're totally fine. They don't end up having uh, some sort of diseases that you know are going to lead to death. They might have digestive upset for eating old, from eating old food, but that bacterial concern is really not one to be worried about. And if you are in a household where you have an immunocompromised person, the key is your basic food safety handling, right? Wash your hands after handling raw meat or fresh food, just like you would if you were cooking for yourself. Wash your hands after you pick up your dog's poop because salmonella can pass through the stool. But that's all common sense, right? And those, so those are easy uh, answers to, to that bacterial concern. The other concern is nutritional imbalances. And I have to admit that there are some people who are cooking at home for their, for their dogs um, or making their fresh food, but doing something like chicken and rice or, you know, ground beef and pumpkin. And it is true. That is going to be severely deficient in a lot of nutrients that our dogs need, the calcium, uh, the vitamins and minerals from the organ. So there is, there are components of the meals that need to be a part of your dog's daily nutritional intake. But as long as we know what they are, we can do that. And so both of those concerns tend to be um, lended to veterinarians because that's what they're learning that they should be afraid of because pet parents aren't doing it right. And that's where we come in because we can show you what your dog needs to have every day and how to do it. Okay. I agree that the risk, there, there are a little risks about it. And I think that, that people are just being sold fear as to making the change. So I just wanted to clear that up. And then I wanted to talk about any potential long-term health effects. Um, I know that they're mostly good, but are there any that you've seen that are not good with, with feeding a raw diet? Well, you know, every dog is different. Just like us, we have uh, to cater to our own nutritional needs and do the same for our dogs. You know, there's some dogs that can't have uh, certain proteins because they've got an intolerance or like in my dog's case, he has uh, a genet a gene that makes him more prone to a very rare bladder stone. And so there are some adjustments that I have to make in terms of what I'm feeding him, especially from a raw diet perspective, because, you know, a conventional vet has already told us they want him on a prescription, you know, hill science diet. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Uh, but I do have to make some adjustments to account for his specific needs. So when we look long term, you know, if there are certain foods that we're feeding that aren't appropriate for our individual dog, yeah, you're going to see some things that you're going to have to change and be worried about. Um, another thing that I just thought of when you mentioned that is, you know, risks of uh, dental fractures. You know, a lot of people are afraid of feeding raw meaty bones. They're like, are you sure my dog can eat this? And the truth is, even though dogs are meant for it, things happen. Sometimes they break their teeth. I chipped my tooth on a chicken wing a couple summers ago. You know, it was like <laughs> <laughs> a complete accident. But like, you know, I, I loved the chicken wing. It was good stuff. Like, no regrets. <laughs> yeah, I was on the grill last night. And, I, and I, if I chipped my teeth, I would not have been mad either. It tasted what, good for me as well. I think when, when I hear about issues that people have with the chews because i mean i've got some pretty crazy chews i got i think the craziest one was the hog's feet pig's feet and i was like mm, i don't know about that then i have to remind myself that one this is what you would eat in the wild and that two that there's instructions guys 15 minutes for you to chew on the specific chew under supervision so that your dog doesn't just swallow things whole a lot of dogs especially food motivated dogs will just swallow things whole 
So I'll read the instructions on these shoes. And then I have another question because I recently learned about this in the workshop is why do, why are there some dogs that are obsessed with eating grass? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. You know, it, it, it could be behavioral, but it could also be that there's something deficient in their diet. So anytime I see a dog eating grass, I have to ask myself, do they have an upset stomach? Because that's what they would do naturally if all they had was something uh, you know, a new food that was not sitting well with them, they would probably eat grass and make themselves vomit. Uh, so it could be that they have an upset stomach and they need to expel whatever's not sitting right in their stomach. But it could also be that they're not getting enough fiber in their diet. And fiber is really, really important, especially in soluble fiber, because it is what creates short chain fatty acids in our stomach, which is basically fermented prebiotics. And there's a difference between prebiotics and probiotics. Prebiotics are what feed the probiotics. Probiotics are the, um, the good gut flora in your microbiome. And you have to have a balance of good and bad. That's why it's, it's, um, it's called gut flora. And in order to feed that good gut flora, you need prebiotics. And that only comes from insoluble fiber. And a lot of dogs have difficulty switching from kibble to fresh food, or even with it kibble to kibble, like switching to different foods. They always have digestive upset because they don't have enough fiber in the diet. And what something like grass will do, it's going to slow the digestive process down. So it gives the body enough time to create the enzymes needed to break down the food appropriately. Else, when things go down too fast, that's when you get diarrhea, because you've got a mix of undigested foods and all of these enzymes that the intestines are, uh, the organs are producing and sending into the intestines. And that's why we end up seeing this soft stool. It's probably not as uncomfortable for dogs to get digestive upset as it is for us, but it happens and we wanna be able to do something about that. So if you see your dog often eating grass, anytime you introduce a new food, you can actually preempt that. You can give them some sort of insoluble fiber like fur or like marshmallow root or slippery elm bark powder before introducing the new food. So that will help them make that adjustment more quickly. What about pumpkin? Is pumpkin a myth? It's not a myth. I mean, pumpkin's a fiber. It has to be cooked down and it does work. But in my opinion, it's sort of putting a bandaid over the problem because pumpkin is high in starch. It's higher on the glycemic index. And, you know, we fortunately are making some moves in the human food world towards more unprocessed items. And what we're learning is that fiber is great for us, but sugar isn't. And anything that's high in starch is going to turn into sugars and sugar feeds a whole host of diseases that we know of, right? Diabetes, um, obesity, it feeds cancer, like so many things. So even though pumpkin can help stop that digestive upset, a lot of times what you're doing is increasing the sugar and which makes the body produce more insulin. And that can often cause some other issues down the line. Okay. Thank you for that. So my next question is, what if, I think another obstacle for most people is, that I hear is that I can't afford to do raw. What is the best kibble? I think that is one of my most frequently asked questions. I cannot immediately telling themselves no to raw without exploring it because it seems like an intimidating thing to do since they have to go to the shop for their dog, like if it was shopping for themselves and put together meals in long term. I really think that what they're voicing is the obstacle is that I need to invest time and then I don't feel like I'm going to achieve the results I'm supposed to. Right. So that's what they feel. So what would you advise for pet owners and what are some statistics behind shopping for your dog since you've been doing it for the last eight years? That's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, first of all, I have never had uh, been able to answer that question for a lot of people. What's the best kibble? For me, they're all sort of the same because they're processed in the same way. With high heat, they're extruded and synthetic vitamins are added. 
And all of that means that it's not bioavailable for your dog. So I, I never have a really good way to answer that question of like what kibble I would feed because I just wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Um, I might look for something that's like an air dried or freeze dried food over a, a high heat processed kibble. Um, secondly, the other question was about, was it about sourcing or making that trans? Oh, what do we, how, how to help pet parents who don't want to make the full switch? They're intimidated by the, the cost, doing it right, and also the time factor. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the first thing is to start with what you're feeding yourself. You know, open up your refrigerator and you start sharing some fresh food. Like if you're making pork chops tonight, slice off a little bit of that, that pork and put it on top of your dog's food. You know, add an egg, add some yogurt, you know, some plain non-fat yogurt. There's a lot of things that you can start off with meal topping your dog's bowl before you make the switch to fresh food entirely. And, you know, not everybody can do, do it. You know, there's, there's a lot of financial constraints, uh, even though now we're finding that feeding raw food can actually be easier on the wallet, especially when you consider vet visits that you're going to save your dog from later down the line. Because, you know, those health issues as they get older, they can pile up and it gets expensive. So if you can prevent that by spending the money now, preventative wellness, you know, it's just like us, we want to eat well now. So we're not having health issues later down the line. But start by adding a little bit of fresh food onto your dog's bowl. You know, whether that's uh, uh, something that you're cooking for yourself in your own refrigerator or meal toppers, you know, dry a variety of dried food that's convenient and easy to add on top of your bowl. Yeah, that's how I started. So I started by looking. So my partner is like a compost addict, like zero waste free. That's what I call her. And she wants to make sure nothing gets thrown away. So then I started asking myself, okay, what can we give the dog? What's not toxic to the dog? So it started off with blueberries. Then we'll cut strawberries and I would give the dog strawberry tops. Then if I'm cooking something or if I buy meat, like you said, I will see if I can give some to the dog. And it's kind of exciting for me to see, okay, is this toxic for a dog or not? It's a really exciting process that I enjoy. And on top of that, my dogs, when I'm in the kitchen, I mean, they're very well trained, but they understand to go to, go to their bed. But now they have a, a, more of an incentive to go and stay there. Yep. You know, so it's because they now believe that when I'm in the kitchen, anything can happen at any moment, right? So I need to be on my best behavior and I don't know what I'm getting. So that's one positive effect about just feeding fresh food scraps um, mm -hmm. and you can look it up and see if it's not toxic for your dog and that's why i tell a lot of people to start is just add in the stuff you're throwing away so when people say it's not affordable i say well we're all throwing away food so there has to be certain aspects that are affordable for it yeah so, definitely now i wanted to ask how much do you spend for your dog Typically, I spend between two to three dollars per pound of body weight for my dog a month. Mm -hmm. So basic, my dog weighs 150 pounds and you know, like he's a big boy. So How I'm much? Say 150 pounds. You're or something? <laughs> he's an Anatolian shepherd. You never seen oh, him? No. Wow. Oh, I've yeah. seen that dog before though. They're really yeah. big. They're big and they're bred to gu uh, guard livestock. Yeah. So Eastern yeah. European. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Central Asian. So they're from Central Asia. They're the national dog of Turkey and they're very, very special. They're not food motivated. Go figure. I have a dog food company. <laughs> it's like not interested. Uh, but yeah, so he's 150 pounds and the guideline is usually between two to $3 a pound per month. So I spend anywhere from $300 to $450 a month for a big dog. But say you have um, a 50-pound dog, right? Between 2 to $3 for fresh food is around $100 to $150 a month. And I know a lot of people that are spending that amount on kibble. 
because their dogs are chronically hungry or even dehydrated and they're just wanting to, they really should be drinking more water, but you know, we think that they're hungry. So we end up giving them more food. The kibble really makes them thirsty. Every single dog, you know, I give them kibble, they're, they're thirsty after. And you've seen a, lot, a big movement to hydrate the kibble with bone broth and hydrate the kibble with fermented goat's milk like you highlighted earlier. And people are now becoming educated on prebiotics and probiotics. My next question for you is, how can we use treats to supplement issues in our dogs? And how can trainers use treats to supplement issues that they might be dealing with with dogs in training? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, you know, traditionally, people use treats for training as a tool, right? We're getting them to do something by motivating them with full, with food. And most dogs are food motivated. I happen to be one of the unique dog owners who uh, faces um, trying to find something else to motivate him. Um, but, you know, it's easy to think of it as a tool and forget that those treats are really part of the daily food intake that we're giving our dogs, right? It's part of their nutrition. So if you sort of think of it from our perspective, it's like things that we snack on. We can choose a bag of chips or an apple to snack on, right? And the bag of chips might taste good at the time, but it's not really providing us a whole lot of nutritional benefit. Whereas an apple is filled with vitamins and um, minerals and nutrients that we can use throughout the day for other, you know, functionality of our health. The same thing goes for our dogs. We can choose different types of foods that are nutritionally beneficial. You know, a lot of the treats that trainers use because they go through them so quickly tend to be on the slightly cheaper side. Um, but what does that mean? In order for something to be cheaper, it has to be made with cheaper ingredients. And those often tend to be starches, right? Back to starches, which turn into sugars and uh, carbs. And so if we can choose or make better choices about what treats that we're using, we can actually use treats as functional foods. And functional foods are, are foods that, not, that provide benefits more than just simple nutrition. And they also can reduce risk of disease. And so if we think about it in that way, what are the different foods that I could be adding into my dog's daily nutritional intake that's gonna be really helpful for them? Um, the way that I look at it, which is, you know, not just beneficial, but in ways of reducing risk for other health issues is I look at those top four that I just mentioned, the itchy skin and allergies, the, uh, joint disorders, the dental disease, and then the gastrointestinal problems or obesity. And so what are the different foods that we can add to sort of, um, prevent those things from happening? My First and foremost, the easiest thing, because you can pretty much find this everywhere, is a lean protein single ingredient treat, because that's going to help us add different amino acids and a variety of nutrients into your dog's bowl without upsetting the stomach, because they're usually very low in fat. Mm -hmm. That's why they're super lean, because they have to be dried and they still have some nutritional benefits. And then my next go-to after that would be probably organ meat and seafood because those are their multivitamins. Those are things that uh, have a, little, a lot of different vitamin A and vitamin D. Vitamin D is one of the biggest deficiencies in dogs across the board, whether they're kibble fed or raw fed. And so the foods that are high in vitamin D uh, would be the organ meats and your seafoods. Seafoods also provide the functionality of high omega-3s which we all know is great for our skin and coat and brain functionality. And, you know, when we first started this live, you were talking about imbalance of the gut, which is called dysbiosis. And what that can lead to is discomfort and behavioral issues because the gut is what produces serotonin and dopamine and all of the things that make our, make us feel good, make our dogs feel good and ready to learn and ready to train. And so if we're using those functional foods that make the gut feel good, the better outcome you're going to have in that training session. I agree. That's why. So for me as a trainer, it's very conflicting. And I think my colleagues kind of feel the same way where we train 
the dogs by not putting food into a bowl and feeding them kibble by kibble because this is going to really motivate a dog to pay attention to us. Like, and this is one of the biggest, I call it myths of training is that people believe it's all positive reinforcement when in reality, most training is alleviating hunger, right? And, and there's an interesting study that you were informing me about that what you want to do, there, there's one person, who, one trainer dealing with aggression that will only move forward with the program if the dog's on a raw fed diet and has been really successful. So there has to be some shifts in our mindsets from always, and I'm doing my best to, to make the shift myself, doing as essential food, which just means we're not feeding from the bowl, to upping the quality of ingredients, feeding from a bowl, or, you know, you probably could throw it out in the grass and, and let your dog chew on the turkey neck, but giving them the, the, the stuff that they need so that they can feel better and show up better for work. And I do see yeah. working dogs. Dogs like Dutch Shepherds, German Shepherds, a lot of trainers are feeding them at least hybrid. Um, Mia has a question. Can you cook the meat or is it better uncooked? I believe you answered that, but we can go over it again. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Is it better? Because everyone feels more comfortable doing cooked food out of the fear of salmonella or E. coli. So can you elaborate on that first? Sure, sure. So going back, our, our dogs have salmonella as a recurring bacteria in their gut. It's what helps um, functionally break down the food so that we can uh, properly absorb it, right? And so the fear, which really shouldn't be, the fear of your dog contracting salmonella for a dog that's generally in good health, they're not going to suffer from any digestive upset. Uh, so that's why, generally speaking, raw is the best choice because once you start cooking something, that's when the nutrients start dying. You know, our vitamins are going to disappear from that. Uh, minerals, you know, they don't, uh, they, they don't disappear while you're cooking, but they disappear in the pan. They're going to separate from the meat and stick with the liquid. And so if you're going to do some cooking, which you absolutely can, if you feel more comfortable doing it, I would do a light cook so that you can retain as much nutritional value as possible in the food. And I would also make sure that you're pouring whatever juice, like say it's a, a quick boil or a steam, all of that extra liquid that the minerals likely have um, separated from the meat and gone into, pour that liquid on top of the food as well. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so my next question is, what, well, actually, let's see if there's more questions from the audience. My dog has no GI issues with switching. You can vary it my dog, though. Let's see. Does anyone in the audience have any questions about what we're going over so far? I want to open it up to the audience. On Instagram, we have followers. We have about 24 people asking questions. Okay, it seems like I'm curious. I'm curious what everybody's feeding that's yeah. that's watching. Like, are you guys uh, feeding kibble and interested in making the transition? Are you already raw feeders and interested in learning about you know what appropriate treats to use as training? So I think it's it's something that we just don't think about often that the treats are part of what what we're feeding. And I think the general guideline is like treats should make up no more than 10 to 20 percent of your dog's diet. And sometimes that's hard to do when you have a puppy, especially when they're food motivated. Um, and that's a lot of times why people like to use kibble. Right. It's it's easy to handle and it's what they consider like a complete food. Mm -hmm. But it, it gets um, difficult when you're doing, you know, some fresh food and some kibble and like, how does it all come together? I have seen a lot of people very successfully do half kibble, half raw, um, or, you know, air dry treats for, for their training, which is just going to be single ingredient and make that part that 10 to 20% becomes part of their daily intake. And they just cut from the amount of food that they're feeding at night. Yeah, I've seen that too. I, I like to use the beef liver treats and you also have gave me, I think, beef spleen. That one's going pretty well. 
I, there was a question about fresh food for puppies, and I get that a lot too. So is it safe for a puppy to be on raw? And then this person is specifically asking, is it what I recommend giving or you recommend giving fruit to a three month old puppy? Yes, yes. I Raw is safe for any dog as soon as they're weaned off of their mama's milk. So usually that's between eight and 10 weeks. You can switch your dog to a raw diet then. That's what they would be doing and eating in the wild. It's very, very rare for a dog to be immunocompromised or, you know, perhaps they're going through some sort of therapy like chemotherapy, which does compromise their immune system. And in those cases, they could be more susceptible to bacteria or sickness. Uh, but that's rare. You know, most of us have really healthy dogs and puppies coming out the gate and we want to keep them that way by keeping them or starting them on a fresh diet early on we're setting them up for success. But if we switch them to kibble and then try to switch them to a fresh diet later on, you're going to go through this whole transition of, um, you know, having to relearn which enzymes you need to break down the food. So I generally tell people once your dog is weaned off, like we adopted our dog at four months old at four months, he was already 75 pounds. Like he's a big boy. <laughs> uh, but he was with uh, a, a very nice couple who was feeding him kibble. And the day that we brought him, we were like, we're done with that. We're switching to raw, like immediately. And puppies are so incredibly resilient. There, have, there usually is a, a shorter transition period between kibble and raw than there is um, as the dog gets older, right? As they get older, just like us, thing, change is hard. You know, it's mm -hmm. difficult to adapt to, um, you know, new things and new foods, but puppies, they're going to make the switch right away. And it's a lot easier to do when they're younger. Yeah, I agree. I have another question for you. So what are some of the biggest differences between pre-made pre raw recipes and doing it yourself? The biggest difference is when you do it yourself, you know exactly what's going into your food. And that's good for a couple of reasons. The first is if your dog has some protein intolerances and you're experimenting or doing some sort of elimination diet, you have 100% control over that. Uh, the second thing is a lot of our pre-made raws are trying to meet AFCO labeling guidelines. Without getting too far into it, I mean, I can if people are interested in this topic. Uh, AFCO typically follows uh, NRC, the National Research Council's guidelines, which was created for processed food so that there were some guidelines for kibble to meet nutritional standards. And in order for any of us in the dog food world to be able to say that our food is complete and balanced, that means they have to meet some nutritional requirements uh, that AFCO looks for on, uh, as their labeling guidelines. However, in order to meet those nutritional requirements, it is virtually impossible to do that with whole foods alone. So pre-made companies, as well as kibble companies, are having to use some sort of synthetic vitamins and minerals in order to meet those. Because you just can't do it with fresh food. It's different. It's the, the, the body uh, absorbs synthetic vitamins differently than it does whole fresh foods. That's why we, we talk about fresh food being more bioavailable. And so what that means is a lot of those pre-mades are going to have ingredients in them that you don't even know about. You know, that's the biggest difference. And if meeting AFCO guidelines is important to you, you know, having a food that's complete and balanced, then that's okay. Then go ahead and get the pre-made raw because it is going to be more convenient. You'll pay the price for it, but it's going to be more convenient. But if you're making it at home, it definitely is going to cost you less. It's going to cost your time. You know, we always have to um, run the balance of what's more important, time or money. Uh, but you know exactly what's going into your dog's food and you can make choices about, am I going to use the whole food to meet this nutritional requirement, or am I going to use a synthetic supplement? The other thing that I've noticed a lot in pre-made raws is they have a much higher bone content. So if you've uh, been feeding 
any food, even dry food, if your dog's poop is coming out white colored, kind of chalky, um, you know, breaking up really easily as soon as it's like, and not when it's been sitting for 20 hours, 24 hours, I'm talking about as it's coming out, it looks white. Mm -hmm. That means there's too much calcium in the diet and the body is not able to absorb it. So it's being passed through. The reason that's a concern, number one, is because that can result in constipation, you know, with things actually not passing through the system. But the reason why pre-made raw manufacturers or even kibble companies will do that is because they don't want your dog to have diarrhea. And there's two things that can stop that diarrhea, fiber and bone. And a lot of times we're seeing uh, an over supplementation of that bone so that your dog doesn't have diarrhea and you don't freak out because, you know, a lot of people will see that. That's the first thing. Like, oh, I switched to a new food. My dog has diarrhea. He didn't do well on it. And they're not really waiting or willing to, to wait and be patient for your dog to adjust to the new food. They're just like, never mind. Mm-hmm. I'm going back to Purina. I'm going back to whatever they were doing well on. And so, you know, even having more bone or fiber, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you have no over control over that. Um, I've seen people have pre-made bras that are dealing with something similar because it's just too much bone for their dog. So they have to go back in and add more muscle meat to offset that bone. Not incredibly hard. I mean, we, it's an easy fix and you can do that for your own meals as well, but it's kind of like, well, what's the point of buying pre-made when I have to add this stuff into it? Exactly. Exactly. So I think another question based off that is there seems like there's a lot to learn from our dog's stool. What else can we learn from studying the stool? We can call it that. Uh, There's, can you hand me that poop card? We just came out with these new poop inspector charts, which I'm so happy about. It was like, this is all the stuff that we need to be that we need to be looking at when we're talking about food. Uh, So just going through this list, I mean, there's a couple of things, color, content, consistency. The consistency is probably the most important. We can tell right away, like if our dog has super hard stools or if they have soft, runny, or even diarrhea stools, basically that means they're not able to process the nutrients that are in the food uh, or the food is too rich, right? And then color and contents, when you're feeding or eating a variety of foods, I don't know if this happens to you, but when I eat beets, things seem tend to come out red, you know, when I'm eating different things, that's normal. And we need to make normalize that when it comes to our dogs, when we feed different things, we're going to see different things. And they're not always cause for concern. So if your dog does have red stools, did you maybe feed beets or something that could have resulted in that? Or is it really blood in their stools that we need to be concerned about? Uh, I tend to see a lot of green when um, not just veggies are fed, but when they're eating grass. And then the other thing that's really, really surprising to a lot of folks that make the transition is they'll see orange or yellow stools. And that is a result of eating poultry. So chicken or turkey in the diet is more likely to turn your dog's stools yellow or even orange in color. And it's like, it's kind of like mind blowing because you're like, wait a second, I didn't feed them carrots or pumpkin or something like that. Um, But it's just how the body processes it. And that's what it looks like when it comes out. Okay. Uh, My next question to you is, with that being said about stool, what can we learn from some weird behaviors like itchy paws, um, the smelly paws, and how can we begin to change that in our dogs? Well, generally speaking, the itchy paws or the stinky paws is a result of yeast in the body. Uh, there's yeast that has been formed and is exacerbated by an excess amount of carbohydrates in the diet. Um, you know, women have dealt with this for years, yeast infections, and, uh, believe it or not, that also has to do with what we're eating. It's not just something that comes as a result of, um, a bacterial infection. You know, it's, it's 
an imbalance in our gut flora internally, an imbalance of the bacteria in our microbiome that isn't allowing us to uh, properly generate the bacteria that we need to keep our gut healthy. And that's what happens in our dogs. And essentially, when there's an imbalance, it's in, it causes inflammation. And inflammation presents itself in many different ways. The most common is going to be itchy red skin. And that's what we see so often in our dogs. And a lot of times people try to mask this. They're like, okay, I'm going to give them some probiotics to help balance out the gut and, you know, make a, a healthy microbiome. But if you're continuing to feed and not eliminate what's causing the inflammation or the irritation, you're just putting a bandaid over it, right? So you have to be able to identify, okay, am I feeding an excess of starches or carbohydrates? And if the answer is yes, you've got to take that out of the diet before you start adding in the beneficial bacteria like your probiotics. Yeah, that makes sense. So you, you would need to remove what is not working and add more of what's working. Um, so we have Mia, she said her chihuahua is very picky and has a sensitive stomach and she loses interest in food fast. She feeds a con of grain free ch chicken kibble and puts cantaloupe and boiled chicken as toppers. Cantaloupe's a new one. Um, what do you think about that, Ruby? Um, well, I'm not sure if your dog's very picky because she doesn't like the food. Mm -hmm. or because you're offering too many options. There's a saying in the raw feed community that picky dogs are made, not born. And uh, I do see this a lot because we'll offer something to our dogs and they won't accept it right away. And so we're like, oh, you didn't like that? Okay, try this. Oh, you didn't like that? Okay, try this. And basically what we're teaching them is if they refuse something in the first place, you're going to give them something else. And, you know, that's not to say that, you know, what's important is that puppies especially get their nutrition uh, consistently and daily throughout the day. But as they become adults, we make them picky by giving them too many choices. Yeah, I agree with that. So I say the same thing when it comes to the dog training community. Like people will say, oh, um, they're not eating this specific food. Well, if every single day we put down the food and we take it and we give them something else or we put something on. The dog has you trained. That's why I say now the dog has you trained. So the way that we would curve that is, of course, you want to make sure that you find something the dog is taking, but give them an opportunity to eat. And then if they're not eating, take the food away and try again later. But that's going to teach them that when you offer them something, that now is the time for it to, to eat. And the same could be said with a toy, you know. Now is the time to play. If not, it will go back in its bin and we'll try again later whenever you're ready. So hopefully, Mia, you found that helpful. Ace, the GSD says, the real dog is legit. So we have a real, <laughs> you have a real one on here. All right. And you know as well as I do that dogs are not going to starve themselves. No. Nope. They're just not going to. And they're, they're smart, smarter than us sometimes. So, yeah. you know, don't be afraid to take that food away and teach them that this is this is food time and take it or leave it you leave it you're not getting it again until tomorrow and there's a lot of benefits to fasting your dog as well yeah. so one benefit i've noticed with fasting dogs is so let's say my dog has an upset stomach for some reason i mean static is obsessed with pine cones so sometimes he manages to get a pine cone when i'm not looking and he gets an upset stomach i usually will fast him make sure he's hydrated right and, and and I'll give him some prebiotics, pre probiotics. But after fasting him, I noticed the biggest difference is just not feeding him, which is so hard for us as humans. Like I, I lose every day and I notice that most people, when you tell them that, they're like, no, I'll try pumpkin. No, I'll do this. When the most beneficial factor is just to fast. And sometimes if it's uh, 4th of July or somewhere and I eat too much barbecue, I eat too much some, of something that doesn't make me feel good, I will just fast myself until I feel well. So fasting is an option for us. If your dog's not feeling well and if you're not feeling well, maybe it's not best to add more to the tank and upset yep. your digestive system more. 
I they they need digestive upset or sorry digestive rest for mm -hmm. sure. And I the way I see it is that's for a lot of us our language of love is yeah. you know feeding each other and we want them to feel better. Like when we're not feeling well, some people will rely on chicken noodle soup. That actually goes back to uh, Eastern medicine where the cure for a lot of ailments was actually bone broth, meat broth. And that's because broth has so much nutritional benefits. It helps uh, reset the gut. We just started adding noodles and all of that other stuff later on but really the, the benefit of soup comes from the broth not from the the other stuff in it and i think that's why the go-to is chicken and rice for a lot of people because it's reminiscent of chicken noodle soup mm -hmm. but that's just not the answer you got to give the the stomach some rest to recover and start again the next day yeah i agree that's what i do all the time i just will let myself reset and and give it another try April says, can you explain why dogs sometimes put more on grain-free kibble? Yeah, because any dog is going to poop more if they're not absorbing the food that they're eating. Grain-free kibble typically is made with some sort of legume, like pea protein uh, or lentils. And lentils, they're a decent source of protein. That's what a lot of uh, vegetarians or vegans will rely on as their nutrition requirement, but it's not appropriate for our dogs. They cannot convert vegetable protein efficiently. Mm -hmm. They can't convert it as efficiently as they can from meat protein. Mm -hmm. And what that means is the body isn't absorbing the nutrients that it's supposed to. And that results in, all right, I'm just going to pass it through, going to poop it out because I can't use it. That's also why we tend to see kibble fed dogs have bigger poops than raw fed dogs because they're not using the nutrients in their food. They're passing most of it. That makes sense. And I, that's what the biggest realization I made with this last week doing the workshop workshop with you guys. I noticed that, like I said, that he was going from pooping like massive poop to barely anything once a day. So it was just mm -hmm. like really bizarre for me. And I noticed the dandruff dissipate. So hopefully April found that, you know, helpful. Now, I wanted to ask, did you have any questions for me, Ruby, about, you know, this stuff in regards to training? Well, I'm curious if, like, what you're seeing uh, people have the most challenges with when it comes to nutrition or treats. Because obviously you're, you're using food as a motivator in a lot of what you do, but what are people coming to you for? Like, what are, what are their concerns? The biggest concern that people have with when they're feeding raw or just training is one. I mean, they can't walk their dog. Their dog is super reactive and then also spitting out food. So the dog doesn't eat when they're reactive. Can you guys hear me? I'm sure I, I have it on mute. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me. Her question was, what is the biggest thing that people come to me for? And it's unbelievable. Well, they can't hear you. Talking. I believe they can hear me now. Yes. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure you guys can hear me now. So the biggest thing that they come to me for is that their dog is not eating on walks. It's not eating in the house. It's spitting out food. The dogs are reactive. Um, plain old, just my dog won't listen type of things going on. So mm -hmm. typically when a dog is outside and is spitting out food, it just means that it's over aroused. That it's in a state of mind that learning really can't even happen in the first place. Unfortunately, we get dogs and we decide that we're just going to live life with them as if it's a normal thing and that we're not going to train them and, and set them up for success. So many people don't even walk their dog inside the house. So the first time a dog gets walked is outside the house. When inside the house is familiar territory, and that's where most dogs should be walked. Now we will progress to something that is a little bit more familiar in front of the house, behind the house. And if you're in an apartment, you can start in your apartment and go to your hallway. The only downside is that for the bathroom, we have to go through the elevator. We have to encounter people who want to touch the dog and do all of these things. So 
that is one of the biggest things. So this person says, that is one of the biggest things people come to me for. Um, and the way that we usually overcome these issues is one, I will ask them to change the food to something that is better. I'll ask them to add in some fresh um, treats. So I ask them to use beef liver. And then I'll ask them to use the food as ammunition towards creating behaviors that they want to do. So the dog performs the behaviors with passion. So they do it because there's something they want. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can train a dog. And, and a lot of the free dog training videos I put out, you can train a dog without food. But you can also train them to be food motivated to a certain extent. I will say the Shiba Inu, maybe your dog, the Anatolian Shepherd, um, those are both. Uh, those are both really hard dogs to train as far as food motivation. Yeah, for sure. And I technically, I have a reactive dog. They are bred to not like stranger dogs. They're bred to protect livestock from wolves, coyotes, wild dogs. So anything that's even close, even though it's very similar in DNA, um, if they're a dog that they perceive as a threat to their family, their property, their home, they're not going to even even give you a minute of their time when you're trying to give them treats. So I have a dog that's not food motivated and also not interested at all in being friendly with any other dogs. So it's been quite a journey for us. I mean, for us, the pack walks in our, our local San Diego community have helped immensely because it allows us to do uh, some walking and some structure, some sort of socialization without interacting with other people or other dogs. And on those walks, we get a lot of people who are, have dogs that are super friendly and, you know, like the complete opposite end of the spectrum that sort of need to learn their own boundaries. Like I don't need to go up into every dog. And those dogs tend to do really well because they're food motivated and will accept treats when they're on those walks. Yeah. And that's something that I'm doing my best to, be open-minded too, because for example, your dog, if you gave it to me, to be honest with you, the downside is that it has a whole bunch of value in a bowl for free, right? But the upside is that it feels good about itself. But I'm sure that if I, let's say, somehow grinded it up, put it in the ice cube trays, and I had to slowly feed it, I, it would be a lot more receptive to the training because now it's slow. That is one of the reasons why I think a pre-made raw diet in the form of nuggets is beneficial. So a lot of my clients, I will recommend the nuggets for them because that will allow us to feed it to the dog slowly. And that will allow the dog to become a lot more motivated. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. I hadn't considered that. So I will, I want to repeat that because I believe I muted myself. So there's no echo. What I was saying to every, the folks on um, Facebook and YouTube was that it's beneficial for you guys to maybe try pre-made raw so that you guys have it in nugget or a uh, smaller form. And then if not, there are some brands that sell it like, like it's already in a grind. And then you can buy ice trays, fill up the ice trays, and then now you have made nuggets, homemade nuggets. But you know, time, you have to put time in for that. So, yep. But you know what? Dogs are a huge responsibility. They are a time commitment. Yeah. Uh, they are a money commitment. And and it's not, you know, they're all, uh, over a decade long commitment. So something that I always try to prepare people for when they're thinking about getting a dog is that it's not just, oh, I need to go home and walk my dog every day. There's training, there's food. There's a lot of different things that we should really think about before we do make that commitment. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's kind of the focus for me as a trainer is educating people on all these things that they should do before getting the dog. Like the dog looks great. It looks like a great breed. Right now there's a Corso craze. Everybody wants a Corso. Is it a great dog? Yes. Does that mean that you and your family are ready for it? Not necessarily. So I think sure. you can do your homework. You should actually evaluate how much it costs for you to feed the dog. Right. Because maybe you're better off getting a small dog and feeding it better. Maybe you should opt out of the Corso and get a toy poodle so you can give it a better life. Because if not, like you just said, for your 150 pound plus dog, we're looking at 300 or 400 dollars a month. And that's right. why you already figured out what works best for the dog and, and whatnot. 
Yeah. So, and you, you've got to choose the right dog for your lifestyle. That's what it comes down to. It may cost me $300 a month to feed him, but he's super chill and he guards my chickens in the backyard, right? He has a job to do and it keeps him busy <laughs> and I get free eggs every day. So like <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> it, the, the, um, the eggs are getting expensive nowadays, so it definitely works out for you. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions before you wrap up? Just want to make sure. Actually, I did see one person ask, is it okay to feed baby food? So one person was saying that they top off the kibble with baby food. That's the first time I've heard that, but I would like your opinion on that. Yeah, no. It, um, the nice thing about baby food these days is that they're, they tend to be organic, high, higher quality. You're not going to find grind grind. You're not going to find ground meat baby food. You're going to find ground vegetables and ground fruit, which they have their own nutritional benefits, but they're not the mainstay of your dog's protein or nutritional requirement. So you can add it on. I would make sure there are no other additional ingredients. They tend to come canned or in a bottle, which is great because it can be preserved without any additional preservatives. Uh, so as long as the ingredients are clean, if you can find you know, one or two ingredients with just like banana puree, or um, I think I've seen some sort of squash puree. Yeah. Get yeah. that and make sure you're only adding maybe 5% of your dog's bowl uh, into your dog's bowl so that you're not throwing off their digestive system too much by having too much of the vegetables or fruit on top of it. Awesome. Hopefully that was helpful. So I want to talk to you guys about how you can connect with Ruby after this. In my link in bio, I have a link for you guys to sign up for canine nutrition workshops for dog parents and for professionals. And you can also sign up to get some of these really bizarre chews that your dogs can benefit from. And I think are really cool to have. And just if you're going to buy treats or if you're going to buy things, you might as well invest into high quality versions of them. And... Ruby, you can tell us more about what you're offering. I know a lot of things are changing quickly for you guys, but I'm looking forward to joining in and getting certified with you guys as well. Sure. Yeah. Well, for Real Dog, we have a lot of really cool products. We pioneered a new category of food that is the stepping stone between a processed food diet and a fresh food diet. So for anyone that's like wanting to make the switch that is why we're here to sort of help you add variety into your bowl. You can do that with any of our treats, but the newest product that we came out with is a food topper. Super, super easy for kibble feeders and raw feeders because you just sprinkle it right on top and it's your organ meat, your multivitamin. So if you're looking for that, it's a new product. Make sure you use Tejan's link because you can get also $10 towards any of your orders in that subscription when you sign up for that. Um, perfect meal topper, just like you see right there. You've got some fresh meat on top of the kibble and then some dried single ingredient treats. That's what we carry. If you're going to go out and go that route, just make sure you're looking for treats that are not high heat processed and that only have one ingredient. That's your best bet. And if you want to learn about making that transition to fresh food, come to one of our workshops. That's under Feed Real Institute, feedreal.com. We walk you through all of the steps of sourcing the food and then breaking it down ingredient by ingredient and putting your bowl together. Uh, Tejan came to our last workshop and I feel like you had a great time because you were busy in the I, kitchen. <laughs> I did. I was doing a, the last workshop was a lot of math. Huh? That's why I'm a dog <laughs> trainer. So it, it was it was a lot of fun and I'm seeing the results with the dog in one week. You know, with the Dutch that's Shepherd, amazing. And it's he's going through an uh, injury recovery, and I'm and I'm seeing it help build up his joint health, and he started feeling really well, really fast. So I am looking forward to getting certified. I'm looking forward to doing more workshops so I can help people out. And I wanted to connect you with one of the leaders of the industry. So if you guys want to any questions asked about raw food treats, how do I do it? I prefer for you guys to go to Ruby, to her, instead of asking me, to be honest, because I am focusing on dog training. I just want to make sure you guys are getting the most out of your nutrition as well. Yep. And likewise, I'm not a dog trainer, so I'm sending them all to you. Thank you, Ruby. And we'll do this again. And we'll make sure that if I missed any questions, we get you guys on the next live stream.
Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. Can you exit?